Welcome to the Jay and Rob Toy Show. I'm your host, Rob McCallum, but you get one other person to listen to for the next 25 minutes or so, and that's my good friend, Jay Bartlett. He is the Skeksis to my Gelfling. Jay, how are you doing this week? I am the one other person on this show. You're the other guy. You're the one there that actually listens and talks to me. I couldn't get anybody else. I'm the guy, you're the guy, we're the guys, let's go. Let's dive right in. This week, I wanna talk to you about toy packaging. This is a topic that you and I love immensely because sometimes we disagree on this and it's always fun to revisit the same conversations even though time really doesn't solve anything. <laughs> but without thinking, Jay, I want you to tell me when you're thinking action figure and toy packaging, what are the first lines that pop in your head? For fantastic packaging? I just said packaging. If you want to go for fantastic, that's fine. But what are the, what are the first? Action figure line packaging that pops in your head. Okay, here we go. Star Wars, Masters of the Universe, Transformers, G.I. Joe, mask. That's that's your top five, I guess. Star I, I Wars, Transformers, no, 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 no. Masters, G.I. Joe, and mask. You didn't give me time to think or give me any, you just said the first one's the that's pop That's right, because I wanted a yeah. gut instinct reaction. And that, so those, those are, that's, that's the order. Those aren't necessarily That's the order that your subconscious five. decided. <laughs> It's funny because when I think of packaging right away, it's Masters and Joe, and probably G.I. Joe a little bit more than Masters of the Universe. Why did you pick those ones that, that you did pick? Are those just lines that you collect so you know them, or is there something about the packaging that speaks to you? It's the iconic imagery. Star Wars, I've gone on for years about why the classic Kenner cards are my favorite, the, the movie still, the back of the package with uh, that classic action figure photography with just the solid colors that I'm such a fan of. Figures just behind the background, it just looks great. G.I. Joe, the artwork by Hector Garrido is, it's all hand painted, it's absolutely gorgeous with the explosions in the background. Transformers with that very, very 80s grid pattern and uh, the, the big painting of the robots. Masters of the Universe, uh, the font is the thing that gets me just exploding out of a mountain and the big bubble. And Mask by Kenner, very much in the same vein as Star Wars, but everything is painted and it just looks beautiful. Yeah, for me, Masters, it's it's all about the logo. It's not even the explosion of the rocks coming at you with the figure in the middle because there really isn't much artwork there. But that logo, that chrome, gristling, big logo, almost card to card, that's what hooks you. It's so big, it's so prominent, and you can put that on any image and it's gonna stand out. But G.I. Joe, I think G.I. Joe is really special and that's because it's so aggressive. You have yeah. black and then you have yellow, orange, red, and white. It's, there's so much contrast that, it, that it's like blinding you. You feel like an explosion's going off. And in front of all this, you have your hero. And I, you know, I think our good friend Carson said, every single Joe figure got their own painting which they no did, other yeah. action figure line did. So it's like, here's your hero shot of Lifeline, or here's your hero shot of Tunnel Rat, or, you know, Low yeah. Light. Like, that's, that's your shot of them. And they're all fantastic pieces of art, and some characters that might not be as exciting as others, like, yeah, Tripwire, you know, he's the mind detector. The, 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 uh, the art of him is just amazing. It made him look like he was in the middle of a battle scene. It's so intense. And Breaker, who doesn't even have a weapon, he's a communications officer. Just, you know, him with that iconic image. It, it's great. And I was gonna say, I was gonna go back to the Mattel, the Mattel Masters of the Universe art, because Mattel does something that is so cool and original. Mattel always used to draw the action figures. They wouldn't take a photo of the figure. They would have an artist draw it. And I think that's really cool. The artist would draw the image of the figure. Yeah, it was always like a visual representation, whether it was painting or some sort of sketch or some sort of interpretation. Yeah. And I think that's to let your imagination kind of run wild with it. But I've got to pick on you a little bit. This is where we're gonna butt heads a bit. And so I apologize. No, you don't. It's the Star Wars cards. Sure. So. You know, I love I love packaging and I love Star Wars, but when I look at a Star Wars card and I see the character on the front and I you know the card and the logos there, 
And they've got that movie shot that's still from where the character is, in case you don't know. I know who Luke Skywalker is, but thanks for giving me a giant 8x10 version of him. It helps with the deep cuts. I kind of feel like it's a glorified trading card, Jay. Like, I don't know, it just, it doesn't feel special because it's in the movie. There's, it doesn't, it doesn't elevate the figure to anything more than what I'm already expecting because I've seen the movie. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And you hit it right on the head when you said it's like a trading card. Because those were the first action figure packages I didn't want to throw away. And I remember saying to my mom, you know, there were times when, when I got a little older around Empire where I was opening it very careful so I didn't damage that art because those card backs were like trading cards. Especially if we're going to go further and talk about G.I. Joe and Transformers, the card art meant everything because you kept it because you cut out the file cards of the Transformers and the Joe. So this is where we have a disagreement again about if trading card is good or bad. I think trading card is kind of disposable. I think they could have done so much more than just take a still shot from the film. I understand where you're coming yeah. from in, in like having a giant trading card and I get where you're coming from with G.I. Joe and Transformers and on the back having the file cards and keeping them so you had all that story information. And of course the decoder for transfer, Transformers, you could see the stats and whatnot. I can, I can understand that to agree, to, to a degree, but I don't, I don't know about that. The front of Star Wars cards, it's never felt like super special to me at all. Now, the Black Series stuff where we're seeing paintings on the side, that feels more special. And of course, we've talked about Masters where we got to see, you know, He-Man done in like oil painting. So he looks like, you know, he's like Conan or whatever. And there's this very, you know, illustrative fantasy world where anything is possible. Yeah. And to me, that just kind of cues the imagination a bit more. If we would have seen like a sketch or some sort of painting of Luke Skywalker in, in an environment that we hadn't seen from the movie, I think that might do a little bit more for me. Did they ever do that with expanded universe stuff or, you know, something from the comics or or anything else, the games? Of course, yeah. When it was characters that weren't featured in films, especially with the vintage collection, you get concept art sometimes. What was really cool and why I love it, and I'll explain to you, maybe you'll understand a bit more, is because in 77 to 1980, we didn't have, you couldn't just go down to the TV and watch Star Wars, right? You had a very limited range of things that you could um, view. So you could read the picture books, uh, there was the record, the books on tape kind of thing. But those were almost like magazine pictures too, right? So I couldn't just freely go look up Bespin Luke from somewhere, right? So keeping those cards also were visuals for the film as well. That's that's a fair point, because obviously it wasn't until the late 80s when we could watch those movies over and over and over again ad nauseum and get the exposure that we have now. But why then stick with that? Because the vintage collection is doing the same thing, right? And clearly we have access. Why not do something more special? Oh, I disagree. I, I don't think it's not special. And there's millions of collectors that I think w would also disagree with you. They, <laughs> can, they continue to do that for one simple fact, my friend, and that's 100% nostalgia. There's been packaging th that, is, that is a lot better, of course. But for us that grew up with the original Kenner cards, there's just something about that, and and it's always going to feel that way when you see it. The the way the Star Wars logo is, and it wraps around kind of almost like a, a Christmas bow. It kind of resembles that. It kind of wraps around the whole figure. Uh, it just it brings me back to that special time. And they know what they're doing with the vintage collection, right? Tugging at our heartstrings. Eh. I'm on to them. It's working though. Well, you know, if you're gonna speak on behalf of millions of collectors, then allow me to speak on behalf of millions sure. of collectors that say maybe they could do something a little bit different. I mean, <laughs> when the Black Series first came out, there was no artwork at all, and boy, that wasn't a good move. And when the, the Black Series went six inch, it was just a red and black box. Again, not good. And of course, we have all that box art for Star Wars from The Power of the Force 2, where it's just Vader's head, and then Phantom Menace is just Darth Maul, and then even in between there with the green packages, was it Power of the Jedi or whatever with Obi-Wan from Phantom Menace in there somewhere too? And the yeah. Revenge of the Sith and Attack of the Clone boxes. 
That's not none, some good uh, package art. There. None what of happened? those. None of those are good, in my opinion. I, I never thought. I, I mean, top of my head, I really like the Phantom Menace design. I like the red and black, the Darth Maul theme. Um, but I like the unification of the Star Wars episode from the, the vintage collection and the original line, and then the different colors of the photos. It unified them but it made them different at the same time. Sure, and I guess maybe after Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, and oh. I think they had another line in there. There's a lot. Going back to something like the Vintage Collection as a throwback because it's the Vintage Collection. Makes sense, I suppose. I, I can see where that, that comes from. I would just like to see Star Wars do something a little different. I think that would get me excited. Which brings me to the big question. What does packaging have to do for you? What gets you excited about packaging? Not just Star Wars, but all packaging. Original art, first and foremost, be it a photograph still of the film, or original art, like, like we said, like Hector Garrido. I want, when I purchase a figure, I want the art to be a part of that experience as an adult collector. It's not just about the figure, it's about the whole presentation. We've talked a lot about one of your favorite lines and that's the NECA turtles and they are without a doubt probably the best turtle figures ever created, but the box art is pretty bad. Even the cartoon depictions of the turtles is not that great. It's great because you see everything and there's so many accessories and I think that's why NECA went with that. So you can, you know, big open window, you see all the accessories, but it just, do you know what I'm saying? It just, it's its not, uh, not that great. It's not that great. <laughs> is this commissioned or is this something? No, you... this is just, I like the, the movie and the idea and it just, I thought I should give this a go. Because I'm also, I'm trying to work on being a better sculptor and I'm not, I've tried to do actual faces and I haven't, I'm not there yet, but you know what I mean? I've done, I did two figures of The Harvester by Steve McGinnis. I did one for Dan Hammond and then one that I was gonna sell to Steve McGinnis and then didn't. I'm Mike Thane, I'm the toy butcher and I like to do humorous and grotesque pop culture mashups. I started as a little kid with G.I. Joes, like the 12 inch G.I. Joes, and I was always aggravated because they never did what I wanted them to do. It was just like articulation and, and holding things because their fingers were, were weird and I could never get them to hold their guns or, or whatever. Usually what happens is I start with a stupid idea that I have to make it real. At one point I was, was on, on a kick where I was making hyper realistic 12 inch gangsters but with animal heads it's like I, i've done dozens of uh mickey mouse Minnie mouse donald duck goofy stormtroopers like 12 inch six inch this is one i have to get to duck vader i made a bigger one at one point and sold it but yeah like the, the mashups are fun if i have an idea for them but i also like to you know like the art the clowns and the, the you might be the killer killers and i've done done caricature customs of, of friends too. I'll see something and know that I can use it somewhere because it's cool and, and, and funny or I can make it funny. You know, I made like a, a tableau. It was all the Toy Story figures and they were all dead. And I called it Sid's Revenge. I actually got kicked out of a, a Facebook group, I think, and unfriend blocked by a guy because I, I made a, a, a Donald Trump. I, I found a, a Hammerhead, Marvel Legend Hammerhead figure and then later I found a Banshee figure and I popped the head off the hammerhead figure and put the Banshee figure on and laid in a little bit of orange paint on the hands and face and painted the, I think the shirt was black so I painted it white and painted the tie red. I got it all done, I was very proud of how stupid it was and, and took some pictures and started throwing them on some of the Facebook groups and I accidentally started a war between Trump supporters and Trump haters and it turns out the guy that started it was a staunch Trump supporter 
We're starting, this is supposed to be a non-political group. We're starting to get some things and as a Trump supporter, I don't really appreciate it. And I'm like, I have not made anything like any statements one way or the other. I put up a picture of a toy I made, right? You talk to these other people. Well, the next thing you know, it's, it's not showing up on my feed and I can't find it, right? Like I'm totally banned. Like I can't even search the name of the group and have it come up. And the, the guy that runs the group that was on my friends list, now I can't even add him as a friend. Somebody didn't appreciate that. So the story of my life is like, I think, ooh, this is really an exciting f chapter, a next step, you know? And then it just doesn't quite work out the way I, I planned it. I think for me, packaging has to elevate the figure. It, it, has to, it has to communicate a sense of value. It has to put me on edge about opening it so that when I take that figure off the card or out of the box, I lose something. When packaging is great, you don't want that to happen. I think. And I will cite a line that you and I fell in love with recently, and that is the, uh, the Spider-Man line that is made to look like the Vintage 94 cartoon. We both dove all in on this line, I think around the same time. And uh, the first thing I thought was great, I'm going to take all these guys out and I'm going to pose them on my shelf, take some nice shelfies, and it's going to look great. And then I got them in my hand. I'm like, that card art is amazing. I can't, I can't do it. What I think is particularly interesting about those Spider-Man retro cards, because they're just essentially Marvel Legends, but on, you know, the 90s throwback art, is those cards are thicker than the average action figure card. And there's a weight to them. There's a, a presence. And we talk about this when we're talking about figures and what makes, you know, a figure stand out when you first have that contact. And it's, bam, that card is in your hand and it's, it's physically hard to pull them apart, not just the adhesive of the bubble, but that card has a presence and I don't even think you could break it in half unless you had, I don't know, some sort of mad kung fu skills or something because those cards are sturdy. Now to go back to one of your favorite package art, which is of course the Star Wars, the 40th anniversary of New Hope and the 40th anniversary of Empire are really problematic because they don't do what the Spider-Man cards do. They don't compensate for the weight Consequently, I have an R5-D4 that is coming off the bubble because of the sheer weight. The same as my Darth Vader, actually. So I have them hanging on the wall, and because of the gravity, the, the, the weight of the figure, it's actually pulling the glue off the bubble. It's a real problem. When do you think, Jay, the switch happened? Because packaging was never intended to be kept. It was always meant to say, hey, here's the toy, it's in the aisle. We're, gonna, we're, we're grabbing your attention, look how shiny this thing is, or you remember this stuff, buy me now. It was advertising, but it was meant to be thrown away. When do you think that switch to being something that went in the garbage to being put in the collection or even not opened at all? Because it's, it's counterintuitive to, to its purpose. It's really fascinating. I can almost pinpoint when that was. That would be 1985, the power of the force line from Star Wars because nobody wanted anything to do with Star Wars toys in 1985. Most of those figures are on card. You don't see a lot of loose examples of those because the simple fact nobody wanted them. So because of that, fast forward 10 years later and you're getting into the early 90s, you know, and um, that's when the expanded universe starts taking form and this resurgence of Star Wars starts to come and all these carded figures now that just sat there, well, all of a sudden everybody wants them. And that 85 Power of the Force line, I, I would say is the first example I can think of. Yeah, I would say anywhere from 85 to 90 and probably some G.I. Joe stuff in the later on, stuff that wasn't as yeah. appealing as the early stuff, the, the second or third reissue of characters. Like, well, I've, I've already got Slaughter from Mail away and I'll play with him, so I'll keep this one you know, the way that it is, or I'll keep this version of, of Duke, or, you know, when you get into the sublines of like Tiger Force or Python Patrol, you see a lot of that stuff because you've already got the main character. So having the reissue, maybe I'll just hang on to it in card for collectability at that point, especially if you've been with the run for, you know, eight, nine years at that point. I, I think there's some wisdom in what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I never ever remember anybody our age when we were collecting, buying something and keeping it in the box. Save the box, absolutely. All my Star Wars vehicles have their boxes still. 
Um, but I don't remember anyone buying one and keeping one sealed. That came much later. Oh, that world famous sound, Jay, means it's time for action figure spotlight. So we're talking packaging. So I'm sure you're gonna show something that's packaged, or at least I hope so for the sake of our theme. What do you got on deck? We were talking earlier about Mattel and how a lot of their packaging is kind of unified throughout uh, the 70s and 80s. So I wanted to show a carded example of Commander Adama from Battlestar Galactica by Mattel. Now this is the card and the figure complete. Uh, he's off his bubble, so this is just together, just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. But if I may, I'm gonna flip it over, Rob, and I think you'll notice something about the back that looks very familiar. So again, we we're talking mm -hmm. about how Mattel had artists draw the toys instead of just taking photos, and we can see that they do that here with the Battlestar Galactica first wave. And I just, there's something really charming about that. I think it's really, really cool. Uh, the Battlestar Galactica line is very small. It's not that difficult to collect for. Who doesn't love Lauren Green in space? So for me this week, Jay, it's funny that you mentioned Mattel because I am going to pull something that's newer from Mattel, and that is the Masters Universe Origins Sky Sled uh, featuring Prince Adam. Now, we've talked about Origins a lot, and you know, they're very derivative of the original vintage line of Masters of the Universe. You look at the figure, you can tell it's the same five and a half scale, uh, but increased articulation. So what do they do when it comes to packaging for Origins? Do they go all different? Do they kind of copy it? Do they mirror it? Well, they kind of wanted to pay homage to it. So while it's not, you know, oil on canvas being done, this is clearly digital art, but it works. It elevates the character, it elevates the whole setup and scene, and it makes me not want to open this figure. This package yeah. is beautiful. Like I said before, you know, that Masters of the Universe logo here, you can put it on anything and it just pops and it draws you in. And it's probably hard to tell for everybody watching at home, but this is actually raised off the packaging. There's actually a little bit of a glint there. So there's a sheen here that just, again, it, it sits, it stamps, it's awesome. And of course, the packaging continues on the backside where you get the whole scene playing out uh, all across the top. And then you've got the figures here too, just like yours. These aren't photos of the figures, they're actually painted. Uh, very accurate representations of the figures, but they are illustrations. So um, again, great choice for Mattel to carry on that tradition. And in a way that I think makes the figures look better by having this kind of packaging with them. Yeah, and what's great um, about that particular package is that you get the bubble um, but you also get some original art on the top of it, which is fantastic. Yeah. I think if that was just the bubble, it would suffer from the sectars, the uh, NECA TMNT syndrome, where it's just, there's no art to it. And we need our art, right? So for them to have that lip on the top is perfect. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Jay and Rob Toy Show. Jay, I always end these episodes on one of these killer questions. <laughs> um, is there ever going to come a point in your collecting life that you will open all figures that you get going forward? That will never happen, my friends. It is ingrained in me, the rule of two. It's something that I've been doing my entire adult collecting life. And it's just something that I have to do because I respect the packaging too much to just rip it open and destroy it. If the box art doesn't speak to me, that's different. But when it does, it's always the rule of two.